Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I'm talking once again with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices orthopedic surgery in Ashtabula, Ohio. He also provides sports medicine and orthopedic surgery services uh, all over Northern Ohio. Dr. Seeds is also the sports medicine director, the medical director of the Great Center in Geneva, Ohio. Good afternoon, Dr. Uh, Seeds. Good afternoon, Randy. Thanks for having me. Uh, today we'll be talking uh, remotely with Dr. Seeds, and, and I, I really want to cover uh, some more ground in terms of uh, uh, the young athlete. Uh, Dr. Seeds has a significant amount of uh, uh, experience with treating young athletes due to his relationship with the Great Center. And, and I think today, um, Bill, if it's okay with you, what I would like to, to discuss is a, a fairly common problem in the young athlete, stretching from, you know, the eight-year-old who begins baseball mostly and then all the way through a college age athlete and the the situation I really want to sort of focus on today is the injuries and the problems that arise in overhead throwing athletes and, and most of those 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 athletes are really baseball pitchers or infielders or outfielders that spend a lot of time throwing, but, but we really see this most in the pitchers. Now clearly uh, overhead throwing is, is a part of other sports such as football with, the, with uh, uh, the quarterbacks and that sort of stuff, but the, the crux of the problem really is in that baseball pitcher that we see starts out young and then progresses and begins to develop problems in the shoulder. Now I think you and I know as orthopedic surgeons, um, that problems can occur all through the upper extremity, uh, including the elbow and sometimes even the wrist. But what I want to really focus on today and really clarify for patients is the problems that you and I see in the shoulder in these athletes. So first, let's define the problem a little bit. And, and let's look at it from the standpoint of, of the shoulder and, and how this problem arises um, in the shoulder in these younger athletes. Sure, Randy. I, I think this is a great topic to start the discussion on upper extremity injuries in, in uh, throwing type of uh, uh, athletics. In particular, in baseball, in our younger athletes, unfortunately what we're finding is that our, our pitchers specifically are spending a significant amount of time in their younger years uh, throwing the ball uh, with repetitive type of uh, pitches that add up over time and affect the mechanics of the of the shoulder and what we're seeing is that these young athletes are throwing the ball so much that they're not able to develop the the appropriate musculature around the shoulder to develop as they continue to throw and what we find is that our pitchers are lagging with the amount of recovery that they need uh, number one uh, they're fatiguing these muscles earlier and number two they're not developing all of the muscles around the shoulder to adequately compensate for the degree of of uh, activity and uh, th I think this has been a problem all over the country and we're trying to do things by obviously limiting their their pitching their the number of pitches they throw in a day uh, and working specifically on those mechanics of the shoulder to try to avoid these problems you know, Dr. Seeds, I think we see sort of a, um, a huge explosion in the number of, of kids who are playing some sort of baseball, softball, t-ball at younger and younger ages. And I think, you know, some of these kids are pushed pretty early and, and pretty hard. When do you start seeing these overuse injuries of the shoulder becoming obvious to the parent, to the coach, and to the, to the patient themselves. What age group do you see these things beginning in? Well, we, we, typically, uh, we typically see these injuries, I think, throughout the age, the, the age differences in minor league, major league, um, the, the uh, high school, and, and collegiate athletes. We're, we're seeing them all the way through but we are obviously, as you've indicated, we're seeing them at an early age now, around the ages uh, between 10 to 13 in, in the minor leagues, uh, where they're throwing 
uh, they're throwing a, specific, a significant amount of pitches in a game, and uh, they have multiple games during the week. Uh, some of these teams play year-round, uh, and, and something to keep in mind, uh, when these kids are practicing, the, the amount of pitches they throw in a practice uh, should be counted towards the number of pitches they throw that week. And, you know, we, we've we got to be very concerned about how many times these kids are throwing the ball, especially if they're not doing any strengthening exercises or, or exercises to, to prepare them uh, for this type of activity. Well, it's interesting. You, you continue to come back to the number of pitches, and I, I guess what I'm hearing is that really just doing more and more of the activity is not necessarily the same thing as rehab. It's not the same thing as conditioning. Where these kids are throwing the pitches, a lot of them probably think that, well, I'm doing more and more and more. I'm throwing more and more and more. Should I not get used to this? And, and I think what I hear you saying is that's not necessarily the way to to get to a point to where you're 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 either treating this or conditioning the arm and the shoulder girdle to actually um, do this in the right way. Is is that accurate, or am, am I butchering that to some degree? No, that that is that's absolutely true. And uh, there are very few very few uh, programs that start with these younger groups in, in actually number one teaching the proper mechanics of pitching, and number two teaching the appropriate exercises to prepare the shoulder for that progressive uh, increase uh, through the season of, of pitching and, and keeping that person from fatiguing and, and being adequately able to recover. So these are concepts that are, are, are basically not, not well known. And you know a lot of these younger teams are, 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 are parent coaches. Um, they're, it, they're, they're in the right mind frame of, of helping the kids, but unfortunately they, the, they don't understand that sometimes, as you might, as you've indicated, uh, by thinking that continually working on these pitches and throwing every day is going to increase and improve their ability, it's, it's actually counterproductive and, and leads to some significant uh, problems down the road that, that can really alter the mechanics of the shoulder. And, um, are, are what we're seeing today. Well, you know, it's, it, it is interesting because I do think that there is this, this concept out there that endurance comes from doing an activity over and over and over again. And, and I think what, what you're saying is that that's not true um, in, in this, especially in this pitching uh, paradigm, because we're actually creating an overuse syndrome. In some ways, that's what an overuse syndrome is. It's doing the activity too much to where it actually begins to stress the growing skeleton, stress the, uh, the connective tissue, and actually begins to cause damage. So, uh, you know, some is good, a little bit more may be better, but, but I'm assuming that what the take home message here is, is that overdoing it can lead to problems that need to be addressed, and it's not just going to uh, be a, a matter of just pitching through the pain or going exercising through the pain to the point where you finally get past that. You're not going to get past it. You need to step back and, and take a different approach. Let's talk a little bit about the symptoms that parents and coaches and, and even um, the older kids, the, the patients themselves, can begin to monitor. What are you seeing as, a, as an orthopedic surgeon when these athletes begin to complain? What type of symptoms are you seeing? Well, unfortunately, when, when they reach my office, most of, these, most of these athletes are there because of some, some specific complaints of pain in the shoulder. Uh, it could be a generalized pain. It could be a specific anterior type of pain uh, in the shoulder. Um, or it, it could be related to after a couple of pitches or halfway through the game, they start to elicit pain. And what we find is that in questioning the, the uh, athlete and specifically the parents, and sometimes we, we have the luxury of having the coaches there also because it may be one of their star pitchers and the coach is very interested in the, the outcome and the family's close to the coach, but we find out that, number one, that if you go back in the history of, this, of, of what's been occurring with this uh, pitcher, you find that they, the first sign of, of the, the process is they start to fatigue and they lose control. There's no pain associated. 
they just lose that control of getting the ball over the plate like they typically do or, or have been during practice. And, and that's the first thing they start to notice. And they start to notice that this expands. Um, and, and then the symptoms, the pain symptoms start to progress. And, and this, can take, this could take actually weeks or months before this starts to develop. Uh, and it's a slow, it's an insidious process that not everybody recognizes and realizes immediately until that pain process sets in. And so we're, you know, we may be two or three months down the road or six months down the road where we've got some specific mechanics that we have to address to try to correct the problem. So if you had some ideas uh, for parents and coaches about what they should look, look for, can you, can you be a little bit more specific in terms of when to notice there's a problem. I think you've mentioned the lack of control and this fatigue phenomenon that, that people are seeing uh, where the, the performance begins to degenerate. Can you give some guidelines to parents and coaches of things they want to watch for either in their child or their athlete in terms of beginning to say maybe there's a problem, let's stop, let's get some help with a trainer or a physical therapist or even an orthopedic surgeon before this becomes a problem? Well, yes, I think the most obvious signs that any parent uh, can recognize or coach specifically can recognize is number one is a reduction in the ball speed where the pitcher is not able to keep that constant uh, speed especially at the younger age when they're only really throwing, trying to throw mainly fastballs, uh, they're not throwing curveballs or anything like that, where they can actually see a change in the ball speed and a, uh, concurrent with that, they can also see that they're having difficulty keeping that ball in control. So loss of speed, loss of control um, are, are very, very easy to pick up consistently in, in any practice or game. And I, and, I, and I think that, at least in our experience, as we've had these discussions and we, we right now we're involved in, in teaching coaches some of these specific things to look for and, and how we can help them with the mechanics early, uh, coaches are absolutely recognizing this and, and they see it and, and they can respond to it. Now, when, you, when, when that situation occurs, when either you as the physician sees it or the trainer or the coach or maybe the parent sees it, what are you recommending at that point that, that the athlete do? What type of a program are you going to institute to try to, uh, I guess, make the, mechanics more, uh, make the mechanics better, the throwing mechanics better, and try to, uh, in some ways, prevent this problem from getting worse? Well, that's a good question, Randy, and I think it all stems back to what is the most consistent process that we see with these with these young pitchers. And, and usually it's the lack of the appropriate musculature around the shoulder and the shoulder blade, the scapula, uh, working together as a, uh, almost as an orchestra in, in working to get that ball across the plate. And we focus on, on a couple of things. Um, number one, to recognize the fact that that this can occur, that we should limit the amount of pitches uh, in a day, um, specifically between anywhere from 50 to 75 pitches. 75 would be a, an extreme number, um, and that's some of the numbers in some leagues, that's the number they use. Uh, and understanding that if you're throwing 75 pitches one day, it, it's going to take you two to three days to recover. If you're throwing hard for that specific amount of time, it's going to take that time to recover. So. You may want to knock down a couple days after that if you're throwing the ball. And also in combination with that is working on specific training exercises that you can do to train the scapular muscles, the shoulder blade muscles, and the shoulder muscles to work on that strengthening so that we don't see some of the common problems when these patients present that I, I can go into in a little bit more detail if, if you'd like, um, what we see on physical exam. And, and these are some, some early recognizable things that even the, the parents can see um, and institute with the coach and uh, can make significant uh, gains in, in what these athletes are capable of doing and ensuring a, a very productive life in, in their younger athletic uh, endeavors in, in baseball. 
you know, I, I do think it would be very useful to, to understand the mechanics of what's going on with the shoulder blade, what's going on with the shoulder through the throwing motion. So yes, I would very much like to, to hear your description of that. And the other thing I would like for you to do, if possible, is to really give the viewers some idea of where they go to try to get the information necessary to make these changes. Is this an athletic trainer? Is it a physical therapist? Do they, do they need to go to some sort of a special uh, physician or physical therapist in order to, to get these exercises to begin working on this uh, before this becomes a problem? So first, I guess, tell us a little bit about what goes on in the shoulder. Um, in terms of the throwing motion, how that goes wrong, and then follow up a bit with uh, uh, some ideas about, about how patients can access information or the expertise necessary to correct that. Well, to, to start off, I, I think we, we want to keep it simple in, in, in discussing this as far as the mechanics of the shoulder itself. And when I sit down with a family and we go through the the changes that we see with their their child or our preteen in the office, uh, the the best way that I can try to describe these mechanics and, and discuss this process with the families, I try to compare it to something they can visualize, and then and then I'll show them the I'll have the patient turn around and we'll look at the back of the patient and look at how the scapula, the shoulder blade, looks one side compared to the other and. And nine times out of 10 to start off with when you're looking at the patient and observing just their standing position, we're gonna see what we call a protraction of the scapula where the, the shoulder blade is gonna be kind of pushing itself out and the shoulder is gonna roll over a little bit. And it's always very easy for the family to see that and, and to understand, okay, well, I, I can see that. So there's there is some kind of an imbalance here that, that I can see the doctor is talking about. And what I try to do is tell them that, you know, when your son is out there pitching, when he's throwing the ball, just imagine that this scapula, the, the purpose of the scapula is to keep that shoulder, the ball of the shoulder in the socket and to keep it there throughout the complete arc of the pitch. And you can almost imagine it as a seal trying to hold a ball on its nose and keep that ball spinning and spinning and spinning. And once you kind of give them that picture, th they get that idea of, okay, that's a pretty simple process. It's the, and of course, we understand that the mechanics are a lot more complex than that, but, but that gives them a visualization of, okay, this is what that shoulder blade has to keep that ball straight. Well, it has to keep that ball in the socket. And, and then we go from there as far as discussing, okay, this is what we need to get that shoulder blade back to help to keep that the, uh, the, the shoulder in place throughout the complete arc of uh, pitching. And, and that makes it very easy then to, to progress on to you know, these exercises that we'll discuss with them uh, as far as the, uh, involving the, uh, the shoulder blade and, and the shoulder. And uh, it, it's, very, it, it's fantastic because when they come back and they've gone through this training and it, it usually will be a six week up to three month process where we'll see some some significantly drastic changes of where they'll see that scapula come right back down. And it's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty satisfying thing to sit there with the family where they've been involved from the beginning, seen it visually, and then seen the results. And uh, it, it, it's, a, it's something that, uh, again, protects that, that athlete for the, the rest of their life. And we encourage them to continue that, obviously, for the rest of their throwing career. Now, as far as where do they go for this information, um, in, as far as our facilities, uh, we're focused on training the coaches already uh, in, in this aspect, but any trainer that's involved in, in that realm of uh, athletics as far as pitching and baseball, they're, they're all very familiar with the mechanics and the common problem of the scapula. And they can, uh, any parent, the parents or the coaches can sit down with the trainers or the physical therapists uh, are also very well versed with this. Um, Typically, like I said, as the orthopedist, I'll see them when they're in pain and where they've gotten past some of these early steps that they could have taken with the, the therapist or the uh, trainer. Uh, but I, I do believe that instituting you know, early education in, in any of the uh, athletic leagues, if you can, with the coaches who are, as I said, are typically parents, if, uh, if you can sit down there and give them a little education, a little visualization like this, 
uh, it can go a long way and it can make a significant difference in their training regimen um, uh, for the rest of the uh, season. Well, it sounds like most of these, especially when they occur early and they're picked up early, can, can really be managed simply by a good change or a good rehab program or a change in the uh, conditioning program that the, 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 the athlete is using uh, on an everyday basis. When, when do you become concerned as an orthopedic surgeon when you begin to see this go beyond that so that now the, the athlete is presenting with some sort of a pain complaint? When do you get concerned that maybe it's gone too far and there's, there's more, uh, a more serious problem going on that you're going to have to address either with more aggressive treatment or perhaps even with surgery? Now that, that is a difficult problem sometimes in, in really discerning where do you, where do you start changing the, your thought process on, on being able to rehab this, this patient because I, I would tell you that nine times out of ten if you get these kids within a, a range of three to six months of, of their problem, you're going to cure, you're, you're going you're gonna to help improve most of these mechanics, and, and that, that's a great thing. Um, as far as what, trying to address your question, I, I would say that, you know, once we've, we've addressed the problem, we've progressed with the physical therapy, and we haven't seen any changes after a six-week time frame, um, then we start to get concerned specifically if they're still having pain and again on exam if we're still detecting possibly some instability that we don't feel has been has been corrected by any of the strengthening uh, protocols um, some of these things as they add up uh, may warrant further investigation such as using a MRI for evaluation uh, that that can really uh, assist us in, in looking further at other possibilities of injury in the shoulder. So it, it's real important to, uh, you know, to have your therapist dialed in on this and, and understand, again, the mechanics of these problems. And, and you can work together in really, really finding these, these people that may be recalcitrant to um, not progressing with the, uh, you know, with the conservative side of uh, treating these problems. So if I hear you right, your, 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 your approach is, is to always try rehab unless there's something just totally off the wall going on with the shoulder that tips you off that something else, maybe not even related to throwing, is going on. But your, your approach is, is that the vast majority of, of these athletes can be treated with an initial rehab program. And if I heard you right, you're looking at a time period of around six weeks to eight weeks to see if they're making progress. And at that point, reassessing the situation to see if you need to go further with additional evaluation. If they're not getting better, uh, what I think I heard you say is that you're going to opt for some type of imaging and most likely an MRI scan. Tell me what you're looking for on that MRI scan. What sort of processes, what sort of pathology that, that as we would refer to it, are you looking for on that MRI scan? Well, yes, uh, number one, I, I agree with you ex exactly with what you said. That, that's kind of the process that, that we look at. And, and obviously, uh, Randy, if there, if there are any abnormal findings in our initial exam that may tip me off to a growth plate injury or something that's out of the realm of the normal shoulder exam, we may go right to the MR scan right away. Um, but, but typically, if they present in the fashion we've been describing, we'll go through that process. So when we do get the MRI, uh, specifically what I'm looking for are, are any abnormalities as far as uh, the mechanics that could be involved in, in this problem. And number one, we look for inflammation uh, that may be specifically subacromial below the, uh, the clavicle and above the shoulder. Uh, we look for a redundancy in the capsule where the capsule may, be, may look a little uh, patchulous or expanded. Uh, th these are all subtle findings. Uh, we look for changes in what's called the labrum, the cushion inside the shoulder, where there possibly may be some tearing of that labrum or peeling of the labrum and possible biceps injuries that we look for in the shoulder and obviously any bony or cartilage problems and uh, any growth plate injuries that 
maybe we missed and, and weren't able to pick up and just it's you know an overuse repetitive process that involves a growth plate but typically we're, we usually can pick those up on exam uh, so, so those are kind of the isolated early things that we look for in the use of the MRI uh, if they haven't progressed with the uh, therapeutic protocol. Now how, is, how are those findings going to change what you recommend to the, to the athlete at that point in time? Uh, are you going to move towards considering some type of surgical intervention? Are you going to move towards doing some type of specific injections? Or, or how does it affect your decision making at that point in time? Um, well, it, a couple of things. I mean, in the younger athletes, I, I stay away from using any type of a, um, any type of injections in the subacromial space. I, I just I'm I'm a, I'm not an advocate of injecting young young uh, athletes, e even though it it, may, it could be beneficial for that inflammatory process. I, I tend to stay away from it. What I'll do is if it, if I see it's more of an inflammatory process, then I I may back off with the process of where we've taken an aggressive therapy protocol and I may say, okay, you know what, we just need to calm the shoulder down here for a little bit and, and I, would, I would stop the sport, I would stop their, their activity and I'd give it a rest. I'd give them at least a two to three week period of where we just stop everything and, and I found that to be very effective with the inflammatory states where we've just as a as a physician and my team we've been a little too aggressive also with trying to get them rehabbed and back into their sport um, you know we just caught it a little too late so if it's an inflammatory process we'll try to cool it down in that fashion uh, and also I don't really use any anti-inflammatories either in the younger people because I'm, I'm not a proponent of that either um, I, I just try to let the body take care of itself from that process if it's uh, if I see that there's a real significant impinging type of lesion or there's, there's something that is more specific to the, the laxity of the shoulder, which is more typically what we'll see, I won't uh, then intervene with, uh, with the uh, surgical intervention at that point. What, what I'll do is I'll talk to the family and say, look, we, we still have the capability of trying to improve your, your child's performance here with the shoulder, but it's going to take more work. And I'll go another six weeks of, of trying to work on this, the, this more specific strengthening phases of the rotator cuff and, and if the scapula is involved in, in trying to assist with that instability issue, which, which I believe is involved in that impingement, and give them another trial of where at least I know we've gone at least three months to, to try to improve that. And, and then if, if I get to that point and we haven't seen that improvement, well, then we'll have the discussions about the possibility of, of working on the capsule and doing some things to try to decrease that volume of, of the shoulder to improve the stability. You know, I think one of the things we ought to point out to parents and athletes and coaches is that the younger the athlete, the more we have growth on our side. You know, unlike an adult who you, you're not going to see any change in the skeleton, uh, if, if a problem is occurring, it's, the growth is not going to correct that. In some of these uh, uh, conditions that we're seeing with the shoulder, growth itself over a period of time is going to, to create some possibility for, for improvement in the situation. And the younger the athlete, I think more of that comes into play. Once you get into late teens, that's probably not as much of an issue. But that's, that's a different factor here that, that parents and coaches and athletes need to understand. Most of them want to get right back to their sport. They think three months is a lifetime to them if they're missing you know, three months out of their season. But a lot of times being down for three months will obviously allow these conditions to uh, improve and growth to take its effect in, in terms of, of the remodeling and some of the things that can occur in the younger ages. And, and that three months to us looks like a pretty good trade-off for, uh, for future health. I don't know if you agree with that, but, but it's something that, that I tend to try to talk with parents and athletes about. I, I totally agree. Uh, that, that's a very good point that you brought up. It, it, you hit it on the head. It's the time factor and growth totally works to the advantage of the younger athlete, and, and that's for everything. And uh, the, the hardest message to convey is that time frame, and, you know, because they're all interested in getting back into that sport. And, uh, but as you know, the experience we've had with those families that have taken that initiative, they always come back and thank you for, you know, really trilling that into their heads and giving them that time where they 
otherwise may have sought other information uh, to, to try to speed things up. Well, you know, I think I'm going to try to summarize where we are as we, as we close with this discussion. One is, is that I think you and I both are in agreement that, that in the young athlete, the vast majority of throwing problems are probably coming from an overuse uh, situation where they're just using that shoulder in a manner that's creating these problems and we need to back up and do a couple of things. One is make sure that the mechanics are as, as best possible so that you can balance the mechanics of the shoulder girdle so that you know that when the, when the athlete is throwing, he's throwing with the best possible mechanics. The other thing I think we, we've talked about is that rarely do these problems, does either pain or anything else, really result in a, in a problem that's going to first and foremost need a surgical operation. That the vast majority of, of these problems are managed through physical therapy, uh, conditioning, uh, the appropriate use of rest and restoration, uh, and very rarely does it require any sort of medication any sort of injections, or any sort of surgery. Is there anything else you would like athletes, coaches, and parents to take away from this discussion today that we haven't covered up to this point? I think you hit them all on the head, Randy, and I think it's a team effort. I think the coach, the family, and the trainer, physician, therapist, they all need to be involved in a, a team effort to, to make this a a win situation for everybody and it's it's education it's what you're doing right now that will make the difference for these younger athletes in the future you know one thing i would like to sort of get some specific recommendations from you um, for parents and, and coaches and, and the athletes and that is do you feel like that that most of these rehab programs need to be monitored by either a physician a trainer a physical therapist or is this something that coaches and parents uh, can get enough information to be able to to sort of manage that process on their own. How would you advise patients? Well, th that's a that's a good question, and that enters into protocols of you know specifically what certain institutions will use in in trying to get this message across. And typically, what we'll do is we'll start off with the the uh, athlete and the parent, and we'll go through anywhere from two up to six sessions of teaching the, the exercises and possibly the mechanics of throwing, whatever we're working on, we'll go through that with them until we feel that they have a good knowledge base of what we're trying to accomplish. And then we'll give them the, the uh, home program to continue with. And again, it's, it, it's, it's really specific to you know what, what the presentation is but they're all pretty much the same as far as working on the, the the muscular work and what we'll do is make it available to them to continue to follow with us once a week uh, if if they need our assistance in in helping them but typically for us like at the great center if there if there are activities that are going on specific to uh, um, uh, any type of education we've given a parent or a coach uh, they can always approach the trainer and and make sure that we're on board, you know, with that activity. So we, we try to make an open-ended process that, you know, because everybody has questions that are different. Everybody has phases in that process that may be different. And uh, so we're, we accommodate those changes. Well, and I think we ought to point out that, you know, it's, uh, it, we, we can tell parents, coaches, and, and athletes, we can give them good programs, we can tell them how important it is, but it's really up to them to continue to do this. And they need to do this and put as much effort in these balancing exercises as they do their actual throwing. And it won't work if they, if they don't participate. Absolutely, and it's, uh, it's, it's, that's probably the most the home run message that, that really should be heard on this today is that this is a lifelong change you're making for this athlete if they want to continue to be at a competitive level in that sport. And we, we try to make that very clear, and, um, and it, it's, a, it's a message that's worth taking the time to try to ensure that the coach, the family, and the player understand that this is a, this is a habit change that's, that's going to affect the rest of your life in this sport. 
Well, I want to thank you for joining us, Dr. Seeds. Thanks a lot for the information. I know patients are going to find this useful and, and young athletes are going to find this useful. So uh, next, next time, what I would like to discuss is move down the upper extremity and talk a little bit about issues that occur in the elbow in the, in the throwing athlete. So thanks for today and look forward to our next discussion. Thank you, Randy. I look forward to our next discussion.